This film is a project of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. May 27, 1958 was a big day for Ernest Green. As he tied his tie and put on his cap, he knew that if he could just make it through the day alive, he'd be the first African-American graduate of Little Rock Central High School. I was the only black student, and there was a belief that uh, there was going to be some violence uh, at the graduation. He had lived with the threat of violence that whole school year, but as he saw it, the more serious threat was to his right to be there at all. It took a lot for Ernest Green to go for his diploma that day. It took federal troops, the National Guard, the Constitution, the President of the United States, and a whole lot of courage. But in the end, he was there because the courts were independent enough to follow the law instead of popular opinion. That independence and Ernest Green's graduation were nearly 200 years in the making. History shows us that the Constitution does not work without the independence of the courts and without the president really enforcing the court's final interpretation of the Constitution. Our rights and protections rely on that independence, and when it's lost, well, so are we. Because while independent judiciary sounds like a phrase only a teacher could love, it has shaped everyday life for everyone in the United States, from presidents to teenagers like Ernest Green. Okay, let's go back, way back, and take a look at how that independence has grown into something most of us take for granted today. When the framers wrote the Constitution in 1787, they established our government in a very specific order. Here's Stephen Breyer, Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. The Constitution sets up three branches of the federal government, the legislative, Congress, which makes the laws, the executive, the president, who enforces the laws, and the judiciary, the judges, who interpret the laws. And they're listed absolutely in that logical order. Article 1, legislative. Article 2, executive. Article 3, judicial. Article 3 uses very few words, and one that it actually doesn't use is the word independent. But it does establish that idea right here. Judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Good behavior? That's a sort of odd phrase that to the framers of the Constitution in the 18th century didn't mean as long as they don't swear and as long as they don't pick their noses. No, gentlemen, you're all in error. It meant as long as they don't commit any gross crime or abuse of power. He or she will serve until they resign or die. They have their job for life. The framers gave judges the ultimate job security so that they could be independent of any political pressure from the other two branches and from us. Judges don't depend for their jobs on the majority because the federal judges are there without being political one way or another. They have less of a chance of being biased than people who are elected by the majority. If you are elected by the majority, you'll want to do what they want. And if they want to oppress people, you'll find reasons for doing it. When the judges decide issues in a way that is deeply unpopular, that would not be a basis for removing them from office. OK, so they're secure. But to do what exactly? Well, look at this. Article 1 gives us a long list of powers for Congress. It writes laws and determines how the government spends its money. That's real power. Article 2, the executive enforces the law. Commander in chief, very clear power. But look at Article 3. Fewer words, the judiciary's power is only judgment. But there's not a whole lot of real muscle in that. It doesn't even say anything about whether anyone has to obey its decisions or who has to uh, carry them out. They said explicitly that the judiciary would be, quote unquote, the least dangerous branch. An act of the state of New Hampshire to revoke the charter of Dartmouth College. Today, the Supreme Court is a monument to judicial authority and the status it shares as an equal to the Congress and the president. Its 16 marble columns point to the sky and the ideal, equal justice under law. 
it's almost unimaginable that the court could be considered anything but an equal branch of government. But this building wasn't built for the court until... Up until the 1930s. It was located in the basement of the Capitol. And in fact, if you go visit the Capitol today, you can walk down and still see where the Supreme Court used to sit. It was underneath Congress. But John Marshall uh, changed that. John Marshall had served in Congress and was Secretary of State before becoming Chief Justice in 1801. He was Chief Justice for 34 years, longer than anyone else. And I think it's fair to say that he's, in a sense, a founder of the Constitution because he interpreted it in ways that have lasted for 200 years and have helped make our country a stronger one. It was John Marshall who really began to establish the court as an equal power. One of the first and most important decisions written by Marshall was Marbury versus Madison. Marshall struck down a law that Congress had passed. The statute is unconstitutional. Because it didn't comply with the Constitution. That's what we still cite hundreds of years later, uh, the idea that the Constitution is what matters. This had never been done before, and to explain it, Marshall wrote in his opinion, see here, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. With just one sentence, he basically says, we can declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. This is called judicial review. Marshall had put words to power that is implied in the Constitution, power that makes the court an equal and independent branch of government. There were some courts in the states that were doing something similar, but this is the first time a federal court, an American federal court, said courts get to interpret the law and place a constitution higher than legislation passed by Congress. There's a lot of evidence that the people who wrote and ratified the Constitution simply assumed that the courts would play that function, that that was one of the reasons they bothered to write the Constitution down. And there's also reason to believe that a system like ours, without judicial review, uh, would ultimately not be worth the paper it, it's written on. Now, jump ahead to the late 1820s when there is a very clear example of just how disastrous the consequences can be when judicial review breaks down and the court's independence is sacrificed to the politics of the day. Andrew Jackson is president. Jackson's nickname was Old Hickory because he was thin but tough. He was a general, veteran, and hero of the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, and the wars against the Creek Indians. He had even been a senator representing Tennessee. I, Andrew Jackson. Jack Palance played him in a movie, and most of us know him as the face of the $20 bill. This is Jackson being sworn in by a much older Chief Justice John Marshall, who Hollywood has yet to make a movie about, but probably should. By the 1830s, he was not happy with the election of Andrew Jackson to the presidency, I can tell you that. Jackson rejected the idea that the courts have any special power to interpret or enforce the Constitution. That was at a time when it was not common for everyone to say, the Supreme Court made its decision, now we have to follow it. Rather, they said, the Supreme Court made its decision, maybe we'll follow it, maybe we won't. It depends if we like it. Okay. So here's where things go wrong. Jackson and a number of states had what they called, and it's hard to say out loud today, an Indian problem. Indian nations were separate from the U.S. Many had treaties with the federal government, like France or Spain. The treaties were supposed to protect them. But Jackson used his first State of the Union address to announce a policy to remove the Eastern Indian tribes completely from within state boundaries to the territories out west. Time out. We're using the word Indian, not Native Americans. It's the term people used back then, and we're using it now because our Indian friends told us to. Okay, back to the story. The country was expanding, and Indians were in the way. American Indian tribes were basically pushed off their land and moved really against their will. Jackson knew that if the Indians were made miserable enough that they could be forced to agree to a treaty, that literally the Indian people would have no choice except to move or die. The state of Georgia was making life particularly miserable for the Cherokee tribe in spite of a treaty the Cherokee Nation had with the federal government, and despite the fact that the Cherokee Nation was, well, 
kind of just like ours. The Cherokee Nation was a very sophisticated tribe. Uh, they, they had their own alphabet, uh, they had their own constitution, and they wanted to farm their land, which was guaranteed to them by treaties with the United States of America. We fulfilled our obligations of those treaties many times, uh, but when it came time for the federal government to protect us, that protection wasn't forthcoming. Now, around that time, America experienced its very first gold rush right there in Georgia on Cherokee land. It was a free-for-all led by state officials. Well, the people who lived in Georgia said, why should the Indians have the gold? We would like the gold. Anyway, they're weaker than we are. So the Georgians simply went in and took the gold and took the territory of the Indians. So the Cherokees fought back. John Ross, chief of the Cherokee Nation, was a valuable ally to Andrew Jackson and the U.S. during the wars against another tribe, the Creek Indians. Now, Jackson had made Ross a bitter enemy. Ross ended up leading the Cherokee for almost 40 years before he died in 1866. Johnny Cash played him in a movie. We cannot and must not lose sight of our political rights. Oh, uh, one more thing. John Ross is my great, great, great grandfather. Chief Ross was a warrior who believed in the law, so he avoided bloodshed and took his tribe's fight to the courts. The Cherokee cause was supported by leaders like Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. And Ross hired William Wirt to be the tribe's lawyer. Wirt had just been attorney general, the nation's top law enforcement official for 12 years, under Presidents James Monroe and John Quincy Adams. The Indians brought their case in the Supreme Court. The Cherokee had many, many friends in power, and it was by no means a foregone conclusion that Indian removal had to happen. In fact, the Supreme Court sided with the Cherokees, twice, really. In 1831, in the first case, Cherokee versus Georgia, the Cherokee argued that they were a foreign nation and Georgia had to respect their treaty with the federal government. But Justice Marshall said, well, they weren't quite a foreign nation, but they weren't citizens. They were in between, more like a domestic dependent nation. Marshall said that their treaty was valid, but because of that technicality, he threw out the case saying they would need a U.S. citizen to sue the state of Georgia for them. So in 1832, Samuel Worcester sued Georgia for enacting a state law in Cherokee territory. This time, Wirt argued that the state couldn't pass any laws effective in Cherokee territory because this state statute violates the United States Constitution. Marshall's decision called the Georgia law repugnant to the Constitution and said the Cherokees' right to their land was guaranteed by the Constitution because of the federal government's treaty with the Cherokee. The federal government holds that law higher than any state laws. The Supreme Court decided that this land belonged to the Indians. That's what the treaty said. The land belongs to the Indians. Georgians leave. To the Cherokee, this settled the entire question. But Georgia officials simply ignored the Supreme Court's ruling, and so did the president. Well, that's the case about which President Andrew Jackson supposedly said. He might not have said these exact words, but he said quite a lot like it. He supposedly said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. President Jackson did not believe the court should have the final say when it comes to interpreting the Constitution, but the framers understood there would be consequences to leaving the final say in the hands of the other two branches. Remember, the court interprets the law, but the president has to enforce it. President Jackson and the federal government made no attempt to enforce the court's ruling, make Georgia abide by it, or to protect the tribe. The Cherokee had won the battle, but lost the war. Georgia and prospectors moved in. Finally, a small group of renegade tribe members went behind Chief Ross's back and signed a bogus treaty with the U.S., which allowed President Martin Van Buren to force the Cherokee from Georgia in 1838. When we think about the Constitution, when we think about the laws, uh, a lot of people just think about a, you know, a piece of paper. But the, the Cherokee cases showed us that the law really affects people's lives. 
and it affects them in very deep and significant ways. 16,000 Cherokee were forced to walk or travel by water from Georgia to Oklahoma. People were rounded up at gunpoint. In the dead of a brutal winter, 4,000 died making the trip. Cherokee call it the Trail of Tears. They said it became known as the Trail of Tears because you could literally follow the graves. A quarter of the tribe was wiped out because the Supreme Court's ruling was not enforced. Every Cherokee was affected, even Chief John Ross. His wife, Quady, died along the way and is buried near the spot where she fell in Little Rock, Arkansas. Buried with her was many people's faith in the courts, even in the Constitution itself. The power and independence of the courts, their protection from the politics of the day, was at an all-time low. It's a very terrible, sad chapter in the history of this country. If you don't listen to the court, then what's next? Uh, it's a question of who's in power. That's how totalitarian regimes are run. Without judicial review, in a word, you have chaos. The Constitution has judges final simply because they think that the judges will be more impartial. They won't be moved as much by political impulses when, for example, the politics, let's say, was very much in favor of mistreating a minority. The Cherokee cases are one of the darkest days, uh, in my view, in the history uh, of this nation. But just over a mile away from this graveyard is a symbol of the court's return to its status as an equal power in government. Now, skip ahead about 120 years to right about here. This is a monument to nine teenagers who became known as the Little Rock Nine, who challenged their state and the nation to live up to the Constitution and protect their rights even though most of the people around them didn't really want to. Their action created a constitutional crisis that involved the Supreme Court, the president, the governor, and the military. Pretty much like the Cherokee cases, only with a much better ending. In the early 1950s, life in the South was dominated by segregation, or what they also called Jim Crow. It was the separation of races built on the pretense that separate could also be equal. And throughout the South, it was the law. But separate was not equal, and to blacks in the South, segregation was a constant reminder that they didn't have the same rights as whites. Life was, you sat in the back of the bus, you had segregated movie theaters, restaurants. All of that was controlled by law. So some black leaders tried to claim their rights in court. Sound familiar? Chief John Ross had tried that over a century before. In 1954, you had the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education. The Brown decision said that separate but equal was unconstitutional, that it denied African Americans their fundamental rights. And everyone knew that the court had just dealt a blow to segregation everywhere, not just the classroom. And they said unanimously, Here's what the Constitution says. It says the state shall not deprive any person of equal protection of the law. And they looked at segregation in the South. And they said, all you have to do is go there and open your eyes. And you will see that a black person in the South is deprived of equal protection every minute he draws a breath. This was before street marches and boycotts and lunch counter sit-ins. No one had heard of Martin Luther King Jr. yet. He was still in seminary school. The man who argued the pivotal case before the Supreme Court was Thurgood Marshall. That decision was very important, and I don't think it could have been given by any group of people but an independent judiciary. And it really should have settled the matter. But to say the least, the court's decision was unpopular among whites in the South. Look at this. People were so mad, they bought billboards demanding that the chief justice be put on trial. The court's decision wasn't simply ignored. It was downright resisted. You know, this system had been in place in the southern states for centuries, not just generations. The resistance was always reinforced by this, this reign of terror. They not only said no, they put people in jail, they, they killed people. Several states actually changed their constitutions to say that public schools would shut down completely before they would integrate. 
states were re refusing to obey a Supreme Court decision, refusing to obey what the Supreme Court said were their constitutional obligations. In Arkansas, the governor was only a few months away from an election and polls showed that 80% of the state opposed integration. So he took a stand against it in the capital city of Little Rock. There had been no reason to believe that Faubus would, uh, would take a hand in this one way or the other. Orville Faubus was the moderate governor of Arkansas. Governor Faubus had seen other schools in Arkansas integrate before schools in any other southern state. Even his own son went to an integrated college. In fact, my mother voted for Faubus. A federal court had ordered the Little Rock schools to open and to integrate to comply with the Supreme Court's decision in the Brown case. But in this political climate, the governor was not going to integrate public schools in the shadow of the state capitol. The popular sentiment was, was, was raging, and it was in favor of segregation. And the governor just rolled that tide uh, as much as he could. We are now faced with a far different problem and that is the forcible integration of the public schools of Little Rock against the overwhelming sentiment of the people of the area. And he never said that he was going to stop integration. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. But the whole state understood what he was really saying. They were there to stop the black kids from going in. And just like the governor promised, the National Guard surrounds the school. When the black teenagers approach the front door, it's not the crowd that keeps them out. It's the governor's troops. The troops were there uh, using uh, rifles and bayonets to bar our entrance. Uh, they allowed white students to go to school, but they kept each of us out, and that was on the order of the governor. But on that first morning, one of the nine doesn't make it through the crowd to join the others. Elizabeth Eckford shows up by herself, and the whole world sees the crowd turn into a mob later that night when these images appear on TV. The governor had defied the court and the Constitution, and now his defiance had put a young woman's life in danger. This was about all the president could take. You have to understand, the president in 1957 was no career politician, and he was definitely no Andrew Jackson. Once the Supreme Court had spoken, General Eisenhower would do his duty. Dwight D. Eisenhower was known as General Ike, and General Ike was known all over the world as the man who engineered the defeat of Adolf Hitler in World War II. He had the same reputation as the men he led. Let's just call them tough guys with a tough job to do. And he led those men into the single greatest military triumph of the 20th century. D-Day. The most complicated and daring military operation in history. D-Day is doomsday for the Nazis. General Eisenhower led the Allies as they liberated France, then marched on to defeat Germany. Seriously, General Eisenhower may have been the most popular man on earth at the end of the war. But now it was September 1957, and President Eisenhower had his hands full trying to keep the peace back home. The president was on vacation in Newport, Rhode Island, and had Governor Faubus meet him there. At this point, the president thought he might be able to talk some sense into the governor and convince him to let the nine black students into school. But the governor was not convinced. With the feeling of the people of the community as it is, once Negroes enter the high school, that day may be serene, but the next day may be fraught with disorder and violence. Meanwhile, for three weeks, the Little Rock Nine went to school, and for three weeks, they were turned away. Can you imagine walking through and having everybody shouting at you, screaming at you, yelling at you? This nation owes a huge debt to Ernest Green and all of the Little Rock Nine. It was a, a huge act of self-sacrifice, it was a courageous act, and it was a true act of patriotism. Finally, a federal court ordered the troops to abide by the Brown decision and let the students in. That night, Governor Faubus went back on TV. Now that a federal court has chosen to substitute its judgment for mine, I must temporarily at least abide. 
And therefore, I have issued orders that all units of the Arkansas National Guard are moving from the school grounds. When the guardsmen were removed, the nine kids showed up and were lucky to get out alive. The next school day, there were over a thousand people outside of Central High. Security was left to the Little Rock Police Department, a small group of officers plus some state policemen nearby. Suppose the uh, group of Negro students try to gain admittance. Would you keep them out? No, sir. I mean, the only thing we're out here for is just to keep peace. But when the crowd hears that the nine black students got into the school through a side door, there is no peace. Students are here. Finally, the mob began to try to break into the school. So Gene Smith, police chief, got the nine kids together, put them in the cars. And he got them out uh, in the nick of time. The world sees these images on TV that night, including this beating of a black newspaper editor, a World War II vet who refused to run from this mob. The very next day, President Eisenhower tells the nation he's going to do what the president should do. The proper use of the powers of the executive branch to enforce the orders of a federal court is limited to extraordinary and compelling circumstances. Manifestly, such an extreme situation has been created in Little Rock. When the chips were down, he enforces the rule of law. And with the very basis of our individual rights and freedoms, rests upon the certainty that the president and the executive branch of government will support and ensure the carrying out of the decisions of the federal courts, even when necessary, with all the means at the president's command. Eisenhower pulled the same sort of strategic move that he did with D-Day. That is, that uh, if we're fighting, we're fighting to win. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm not responding to an earthquake, I'm not responding to some natural disaster. He says that I'm going to send men in there armed and prepared to shoot and kill if necessary to protect the constitutional right of these children to go to school. We are a nation in which laws, not men, are supreme. Our personal opinions about the decision have no bearing on the matter of enforcement. The responsibility and authority of the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution are very clear. So it comes to this, the 101st Airborne, the same unit that parachuted over Normandy on D-Day, is now going to enforce the law. President Eisenhower sent in a thousand paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division of the United States Army, federalized the Arkansas National Guard. Only then, after all of that, did we finally physically uh, get into school. So the paratroopers went in to enforce the law, not to inhibit the law. And I think that made a very great difference to the United States. I'm very glad he did it. But getting the Constitution right is a process. The framers knew it would be, and they were right. The Little Rock Nine attended Central High, but at the end of the school year, the school board sued to delay integration another three years. That fall, the case ended up in the Supreme Court as Cooper v. Aaron. The court heard Cooper v. Aaron in an emergency session in September 1958 and issued its decision the very next day. The Supreme Court uh, recognized that this was really a crisis for our nation. And the decision goes like this. Article 6 of the Constitution makes the Constitution the supreme law of the land. See that? And since 1803 in Marbury versus Madison, the court says what the law is. Bottom line. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution, and the law of the land that we announced in Brown applies in Arkansas as it does in every state across the country. All nine members of the court signed the opinion to show there was complete unanimity, and they all agreed. They weren't being anonymous. They were saying, this may be controversial, nation, but this is the law, and we're all willing to stand up and say it. That was a bold, aggressive, uh, unparalleled opinion. The Cooper decision left no room for doubt in two ways. 
There was no doubt that segregation was unconstitutional in Arkansas and every other state. And there was also no doubt that two centuries after John Marshall established the court's independence, our constitutional system relies on the equal power of an independent judiciary. It's a decision that really helped every American, saying that you, whoever you are, you understand you live in a country that lives up to its ideals, a country where those fine words in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution work. They mean something. After the Brown and Cooper decisions, life in America began to change. See this? Thurgood Marshall, who argued both Cooper and Brown, well, he became the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. But even after Cooper, integration happened slowly. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Active resistance continued for over a decade. And 50 years after Brown, almost two centuries after the Cherokee cases, America sometimes still struggles to protect the rights of minorities, racial, religious minorities, and others. But that's another movie, and I want to end this one where we started. Ernest Green was the only senior of the Little Rock Nine, so he was the only one to graduate at the end of that long year. You know, I didn't know a lot, but I knew after spending that year going through all that, I was going to that ceremony if you had to carry me there. That day, Ernest was alone in the crowd, but far from lonely. His family came to see him get his diploma, the media came, and of course, the National Guard was there too. And as Ernest Green walked across the stage in total silence to take the diploma that he earned, a surprise guest quietly slipped into the stadium. A young preacher who was becoming a national leader named Martin Luther King Jr. It was a graduation for the entire nation. Once a president had his own reasons to send troops into a state. To enforce the decision of the court? No. To evict the Indians. A century later, another president sent troops into a state to abide by the court. Eisenhower said we must enforce the law, and he sent the paratroopers, federal troops, not to disobey the law, but to see that the law was obeyed. That was a big step forward. A big step forward for the president, the Constitution, and the court. The court in its day, over the course of 100 years, 200 years, more than that, has had, in a sense, its political ups and downs. Sometimes people get very angry at the courts. Sometimes they tend to be less angry, they support the courts. But through all that, basically the court has survived. And gradually over time, gradually, and I stress it's been gradual, the American public has learned that they should, and indeed they do, follow decisions that they disagree with. And that is a big step forward for the nation.